And we're recording. Ugh. I'm always paranoid that one of these days we're not gonna hit record. We're gonna think we're gonna we hit record. Okay, we're recording. <laughs> it's not. It. <laughs> yes, I know. We're gonna do a half hour and forty five minutes of. Oh, that was really good. That was like a, one of our best <laughs> ones know. ever, and and then not record it. Not record any of it. I yeah, know. that's that'd be our luck. Yeah. Well, the uh, two girls did. I think they were going back and re-watching their, I think it was their first episode, or no, it was unre- It was an unreleased first episode. Okay. So they did like a couple, two, three episodes to kind of get the hang of it, but never released them. Uh-huh. And so at like, I think it was their hundredth episode or something like that, they went back and they like live reacted to their very first unreleased one mm-hmm. and didn't hit start. Oh. And so they went through like a 45 minute video live reacting to it. So I'm sure this was gonna be well over an hour of content. And then like, it was most of the way through, I think. And they realized that they had not hit start. And I'm so disappointed because I wanted to hear, they ended up playing the like, original recording, mm-hmm. but I wanted to hear them react to it because, right. you know. You're... Because it was probably cringe to them <laughs> yeah. after, a, you know, 100 episodes, you, yeah. you get pretty Two good Two years at... later, yeah. they were doing it, I was like, oh. Would you like to do an introduction now that we're like already two minutes into the recording and uh, haven't actually indicated that this is this and that, the coffee chat, episode five? <clears throat> We're a whole month into this. So. Yes. Welcome back to another episode of This and That, a coffee chat with the Harrows. Uh, we've got some things to recap from last week. Yes. Um, some more economic news uh, that came out. Uh, some scary real estate fraud stories to talk through. Dun, dun, dun. I, I could do that also for the economic <laughs> news, but we're going to save that for towards the end. We're kind of changing things up a little bit uh, because, um, you know, are we heading into a recession? Question mark. Cliffhanger. Cliffhanger. It's the best I can do. Okay. <laughs> and then, of course, we'll wrap up with uh, what we're looking forward to in the next week or so. Yes. So... I think the big update is... Yes. So after our long discussion last week about Sarah J. Moss and uh, Throne of Glass, I did go out, well, thanks to Amazon, I I procured... Amazon Prime Day happened to be the second day uh, of that when we recorded last week. And so... And I was all ready to settle in last week and start reading... And matter of fact, I read the first paragraph and I was actually like, I, well, I really like this, this writing style. And then I went to the front. So you just skipped the whole front piece. You oh. didn't read the, the dedication? Or? Well, I read the dedication oh, okay. and then I, I looked at the map, yeah. you know, nice little map in here. And I like, oh my God, I'm going to definitely need my glasses <laughs> to see that. She does do a good job with her maps. I like all of her maps. And then I started, you know, I read the first paragraph. And I'm like, okay, that, uh, you know, sometimes you just know that you like a writing style. And then sometimes you know that you, you don't, you don't. Yeah. Hey, if you know, you know. And then I, I was like, okay. And then I just, for some reason, flipped to the front where it lists all the books in the series and noticed that although this is called Throne of Glass, it's mm-hmm. the second book in the series. So I stopped reading. I was like, okay, now do I have to go and order the Assassin's Blade? Until my daughter clarified kind of things for me. So do you want to explain? Yes. So the Assassin's Blade, although listed first in the sequence of these books, is a prequel set of novellas. So the book is made up of five individual novellas. And... It has been a hotly debated topic in the fandom as to what is the proper reading order of this series. And I've heard everything from Assassin's Blade being first, third, or fourth as to where to read it. So recently, SJM came out with her preferred reading order, which put it third. 
So when I was going... It would be nice if her publisher would do likewise. <clears throat> yeah, well, if you go to her website and her FAQs, it specifically addresses this question. Um, and so I, when I read it, I read it third. And I was thinking about this this week, actually. Um, and, and the idea of putting it fourth and why do some people put it fourth rather than third because they're kind of similar. Mm -hmm. um, and I think people put it fourth because some of the events of Assassin's Blade come back around starting in the fourth book. So okay. in one through three, a lot of what happens there isn't as relevant. It's background if you happen to know it, but it's not actively like what's going on in the storyline. That comes back around in book four with some things that happen and then it kind of goes from there. Basically everything that happens in the Assassin's Blade becomes relevant later on. There are no throwaway characters okay. from that book. Um, I think, again, kind of going back to our conversation last week of the hero's journey right. and that cycle that they go through, I think the reason that she probably put it as reading it third is because at the end of book two, the main character is at the point where she is leaving her world and going to her next world to where she levels up. Level up, level up, level up, level up, level up. Right. Gets more powerful, comes into who she's going to be more of through the rest of the books. Um, and so if you read it fourth, you're sort of jumping around to where she's leveled up and then you come back to her as who she was uh, previously. Okay. If you read it third, you get the prequel to the first two that you've read and who she is at that point in time before she goes and changes. Okay. So I think that's why it makes sense as the third book of the series. I think the problem with reading it first on an initial read through is that there's no real attachment to the characters yet. And some of the prequels in it are like 50, 60 pages. So they're just these like little short novellas as part of it. And it's like, okay, great. But like, I kind of don't really care. I don't really care. No. Who is this character? No background on her. Um, you're moving from place to place on the map. So you're not spending a lot of time in each city as she goes along. It's, so nothing's really established. Yeah, you don't feel like, okay, I'm set here in this world because she's bouncing around. Okay. And so I think by reading the first two, or reading Throne of Glass and, and Crown of Midnight as the first two, and then reading it third, you have a foundation as to who this character is. Yes, there are some minor spoilers of what's going to happen by the end of Assassin's Blade. But like, I kind of didn't care, at least up until that last novella. And you're like, this part's going to suck because I know what happens and it's not good. <laughs> so other than that part of it, you know, it's like, it's fine with the spoilers there. Spoiler alert. So I think third is a good spot on that. Okay. And then uh, you had mentioned last week that you're rereading The Lord of the Rings, mm -hmm. starting with the, uh, the uh, Fellowship of the Ring. Mm -hmm. And so I had mentioned that every time I read the, the Lord of the Rings, there's something new that, not something new, but something I had forgotten. Yeah. And, and so have you encountered that yet? Or do you have anything to talk about there? So it was funny. I was at the clubhouse getting us dinner last night you weren't able to join and so I brought a book with me because I was going solo so yes if you do see someone reading a book at a bar it may be me because um, <laughs> that was me last night um, and someone was there and asked hey you know what are you reading and so I showed them and like I'm you know rereading the the Lord of the Rings I'm on the first one and she goes, oh, well, I've, I've watched the movies before. And I was like, well, as a matter of fact, I am in the middle of a series of chapters here that don't make an appearance in the movies. And in fact, a couple of characters here, being Tom Bombadil and Goldberry, that mm -hmm. don't show up at all. Right. Um, but I was thinking about it, and you know, in the movies, you get the point where... Uh, the Black Riders are chasing them out of the Shire, they get to the river crossing, they cross the river, and then when you pick back up with them, they're basically into Bree. They're leaving the forest and entering Bree right. to go to the, the inn there. 
Um, and so as I'm going through, there's the whole chapter about the old forest. Right. And old man Willow. And yep. Mary and Pippin almost getting killed by him. Well, and, and it's interesting. So uh, Peter Jackson, when he made the movies, um, just felt it would hurt the pacing too much to take this little side diversion and do the Tom Bombill and Goldberry portion of it. Mm -hmm. However, he does the old man Willow in, in Fanghorn the, yeah, Forest with in Treebeard towers. in the Two Towers. Yeah, so he so takes he, that idea and just moves it, it, it later. moves it there, and then has Treebeard save him instead of Tom Bombadil. Yeah. So, so it's. Um, I actually watched a video this week that showed how often Peter Jackson would have different characters say lines of other characters that from the book, but because the words were so important that they wanted to include them, but it, in order to fit it into the script, they had to have another character say it. Interesting. Huh. And move, move it from, sometimes even from one book to another book. Like this one. Like this one. And so... Um, Peter Jackson did a lot of that. And uh, I don't think I sent you that video. I should probably do that. And, mm -hmm. and what was also interesting is every time they thought they would stray away from the books and as they were writing the script, they'd always come back to, this isn't working. Tolkien knew what he was doing. <laughs> <laughs> every draft that we wrote, it became closer and closer to what, what was in the book. It became nearer to Tolkien. They tried a lot of different things, and sometimes they thought of going in a different direction from the book. And every time they tried to do that, gradually they find that actually Tolkien knew what he was doing. So, so they always, always ended up going back to Tolkien's script some way. They, although, again, might be a little bit rearranged or who says what and that type of thing. Yeah, I think one of the other things that I, I re remembered earlier on in the book was how much time passes between Bilbo's going away party. <laughs> and when Frodo actually starts his journey out of the Shire. Yes. Because in the movies, it's like bang, yeah, bang. It's like next week. Yeah, this happens. In the book, it's like 17 years later. Right. So Frodo goes from being 33 to 50. Right. In this time. That's a lot of time that passes and, you know, a lot of things that can happen beyond the Shire in that time period. Yes. And I always, when I get back to the part, I'm like, oh yeah, the, this is a long time and a lot of preparation and a lot of moving of outside forces outside of the Shire and yes, and all of that that's going on that, at least at this point in the book, we're not really filled in on other than there are these black writers all of a sudden who have showed up well yes and you know uh actually some of that time is going to be covered in the new movie that they're doing i think it's called the search for Gollum, oh. that andy circus is directing okay and it's going to talk about how gandalf and aragorn and some others were searching for Gollum to try to find him before sauron mordor and took mordor him. found him and so that's coming out in a, in a new movie, which isn't really covered in Tolkien's books, but other than mentioned briefly that Gandalf mm -hmm. tried to find him before the Dark Lord did and, and uh, wasn't Failed. able to do so. Yeah. So what's next? Uh, well, there was some racing that uh, happened this weekend. Yes. Auto racing. I'll, I'll let you talk about Formula One. <laughs> I will uh, fully disclose I was absolutely wrong uh, about Indianapolis and the NASCAR races. I had indicated that usually that leads to a boring race. And I have to say that both the Xfinity race and the uh, Cup race were absolutely great races to watch. Entertaining, lots of strategy going on. Uh, amongst the teams, especially in the cup race, they had to do a lot of fuel savings. So you're watching mm -hmm. uh, the telemetry on drivers going down uh, the, the long stretches at 50% throttle because they're trying to make sure that they can make it to the end of the race. And uh, uh, Brad Kozlowski, I mean, it, on their, their uh, how much fuel's left, they were off the chart. 
he he ran about nine laps further than they thought it was possible, even with fuel saving. Jeez. And coming to the second to last restart, he had to duck into the pits from the lead position mm. because the car started sputtering. And so that made for, you know, Kyle Larson able to move up alongside Ryan Blaney. There was a caution on that restart, so then they did another green-white checkered. And I was a little disappointed in NASCAR because on that green-white checkered, a car spun out in turn two, flattened his tires, and got basically high-centered, and it was obvious that he wasn't going to be able to move. He got it to the edge of the track, and that's as far as he can go. And NASCAR didn't throw the caution for ten, until like 10 seconds later until uh, Kyle Larson had already crossed the start-finish line. And I think it deprived us, which meant the race was over. So once the white flag comes out, any flag, the next flag ends the race. And so if it's the caution flag or the checkered flag. And I think we will have had a really exciting duel between Ryan Blaney and, and Kyle Larson on that last lap. And so I really kind of wish they would have thrown it because I knew, sitting on my couch, that that car wasn't going to get off the track and out of the way and was going to be a hazard. So, I wonder if not throwing it was in response to a couple of weeks ago when they had that five overtime attempt. Uh, At Iowa. Race. I think there might have been something to, to do with that. And trying to not repeat that again. Yeah. Which was also interesting on the fuel safe part of it because they had so many restarts in that race yeah. as well. And I, I but and the, sometimes the networks get involved. And quite frankly, it was a very difficult broadcast because shortly before the race started president biden announced that he was going to drop out of the race mm -hmm. so nbc news took over the broadcast so they moved the start of the race over to usa network and then after about 10 15 minutes of racing on usa they moved it back to nbc and then as five o'clock was approaching on the east coast um, the networks basically told NASCAR it's going to be really important to get the local news on because this is a major event. So we're moving the broadcast back over to USA. So it started on USA, went to NBC for the bulk of it, and then finished on USA. And that feels like a golf schedule where you know you just have eight <laughs> hours of golf on, and so they ping you back and forth. But yes, so it. That had to be, and, and so I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they just said, let's just get this thing over with, so. Yeah, we're done. We're done. <laughs> Disappointing though. Uh, and the Xfinity race was even more exciting and I wish I could tell you all the details, but I just remember having a really good time watching it. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, I was wrong when I predicted boring races. I thought both of them were, were quite good and quite entertaining and a lot of strategy, strategery going on in both of them. So, Formula One was interesting. Oh, Formula One was interesting. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> once again, McLaren, with the interesting strategy calls that, as we discussed, somehow managed to turn a 1-2 into what felt like a loss, that takes some talent. Another wrong forecast from me last week where I thought that, you know, McLaren's going <laughs> to learn from their mistakes and not, not make these strategy errors. But Wrong, sir. Wrong. What did they do? Well, I mean, they the finished end one, result two. was yes. not a strategy mistake. They just didn't maybe go about it in the right way getting there. Uh, no. So <laughs> why don't you explain to the good folks that might not follow Formula One, what, what did McLaren do that made it really awkward? It was awkward for sure. For the team. So at, going into the final pit stops, Oscar Piastri was leading Lando Norris first and second, and Oscar had built up a pretty sizable lead and then had a little off-track moment that dropped his lead down to one and a half, two seconds. Yeah. And at that point, they couldn't really double stack, meaning they couldn't both pit on the same lap um, without delaying Landon Norris. What they were trying to do is they were trying to preserve that one too, and normally in, in this sort of situation, lead car gets priority. So Oscar right. should have been the first to pit. 
this there at Hungara Ring um, in on this track there is a big undercut, meaning if you pit first and have a good outlap, you can then be ahead of the cars in front of you that have older tires that were doing slower laps by the time they come in to pit and then come back out. Yes. And so McLaren was worried about Norris being undercut by, by Lewis Hamilton. By Hamilton behind him and or potentially Verstappen behind him. Um, and so they gave priority to Norris to come in first, essentially undercutting Oscar, even though Oscar should have traditionally been given priority to come in and pit first. Yes. And what happened was Oscar was undercut and ended up coming out of the pit second, being promised from the team that he was going to get his first place back. Oh, well, that is awkward. Yeah, don't, don't worry about Lando. Don't worry about Lando. We'll take care of it. Yeah, well... Took about 15, 20 laps. Yeah, it took a long time and a lot of radio messages that the team probably didn't want being public radio messages. It was a little embarrassing. <laughs> it was a little embarrassing. Um, three laps before the end, Lando finally let Oscar through and neither of them seemed particularly happy standing on the podium with McLaren's first one-two since Monza 2021. Yeah, and, and it was Oscar's, he'd won a sprint race before, but he hadn't won a, a full uh, Grand Prix. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's his first win. And his would not know. <laughs> his response on the radio was just sad. Yeah. I mean, it, it was muted. He. Yeah. I think his mom was more excited for him than he was. <laughs> if you follow her on Twitter, see what she posts. Okay. Yeah, so it, it was sad. And, and so the conversation after the race by all the pundits isn't about how strong McLaren is doing, that they got a 1-2 at, at the Hungary Grand Prix. It's about how they totally messed up the mm -hmm. handling of those pit stops and mm -hmm. the flopping of positions, which is so alien to most motorsports fans outside of Formula One, that mm -hmm. there are team orders and that teams literally tell you to slow down and give up a five second lead. <laughs> You're kidding me, right? In fact, you can't do that in NASCAR. Oh, no. No. Yeah. Matter of fact, you can't actually accidentally spin out in NASCAR to cause a caution to help your teammate, I which mean, is what Michael Waltrip did and ended up costing him his team because the penalties that they were issued for that accidental spin at Richmond uh, cost them sponsorships and all kinds of stuff. And Michael Waltrip ended up having to fold his race team. Oh, wow. That's, yes, so that, that's stuff we don't, we don't allow in NASCAR. But in Formula One, it happens. Right it hasn't here. happened as often lately, but, you know, 10, 15 years ago, it happened all the time. You'd, There's still enough of it every season. You saw it during Mercedes' dominance when Valtteri Bottas, Bottas it's not English. English as a foreign language is English. But nonetheless, I'm struggling. <laughs> was often told to to let Lewis Hamilton pass because Lewis, Lewis Hamilton was running, was the number one driver, yeah. and was going for the championships, and he won many of them. So, I think that's another big difference between F1 and a lot of the other motorsport series is that on some teams there's a clear number one driver and a yes. clear number two driver, and there are strategies and priorities made based off of who you know number one is and favoring them and again doesn't happen you know nascar well and in, in a different way it has been demonstrated by the haas team earlier this year when kevin magnuson was a true menace to the rest of the field to allow nico hulkenberg to move ahead and get in into the points positions because yeah. they only award points to the top 10 finishing cars and he would just do everything possible to keep people back so that Nico could build up a cushion. And matter of fact, he earned penalty Penalties, points yeah. uh, for some of his actions. But that's a different way that a the number two driver might help out the number one driver. Not that Haas has every, ever said clearly that there's a number one, number two, but it's clear that Nico's the number one driver yeah. at Haas right now. So, I think in NASCAR, the one way this does play out is 
switching um, pit crews yes. come playoffs in particular. Yes. If you have a pit crew on a team that hasn't made the playoffs or has been eliminated as the rounds go in the playoffs and is clearly better and, and just yes. on a roll compared to someone else um, in their, their pit crew team, you might see a swap there. Yes. But that's about the extent of, of kind of what NASCAR or teams will do to aid another team. Yes. So anyway, back to McLaren. Oh, yeah. We, we were <laughs> we're, talking about McLaren about a half hour ago. <laughs> where we started all of this was we have one more race before summer break. We're at Spa this weekend. Mm-hmm. Maybe they won't be the headline for the wrong reasons for the third week in a row. I'm going to question how good the McLaren is going to be at Spa mm. because uh, Spa has very long straightaways and I don't know that McLaren has demonstrated top end speed. They've been very good through corners and their handling. Um, this is where teams like, at least in past years, Williams has kind of stood out. Yeah. Ferrari has stood out. Um, and now, Bull. Of course, they in Red Bull. Of course, they've made adjustments, you know, since then. But I'm not, I'm not sure how good. It'll be interesting to to see if they can bring a low downforce package, and still perform as well as they have at the last two tracks, which have had lots of intricate turns that 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 package really showed its stuff in. Well, hungry the Monaco without walls. Yes, yes. That tells you enough about what that track looks like. Yes. So that'll be interesting. The other thing that was kind of interesting was um, Max Verstappen. Yeah. And how absolutely crabby he was. Yeah, this was, we've seen this from him before, but it's been a while. Yes. Now, part of that, I think, is because he's been winning so much and everything's yes. better when you're winning. But this was another level compared to what we've seen recently of. Don't try baby. So radio chat from him as a little backdrop. Um, if you didn't know, Max is also really big into virtual racing, I racing, uh, sim in, racing, sim racing. Uh, and, and he's really good at it. Shocker. He, I know I'm the video game boy. I'm the one who wins. Yes. And <laughs> he has a, a team that he does team races with called red, red line racing. And a number of races back, his team was running the 24 hours at the Nürburgring. Is that Imola? No, that's the... No, no, no. Was that... Oh, it might have been F1 Imola. Yeah. race, Imola. It might have been. And he was up till 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the morning racing and then ran his race and I believe won. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so the leading up to this weekend was the 24 hours of spa race. And again, he was up till 3.30 in the morning racing with his team. And so the announcers, forgetting that just a month ago, he had done the same thing. Forgetting or not caring because it's a, yeah. a nice talking point. They just became fixated on how crabby Max was and blaming it on the fact that he didn't get enough sleep because he was busy eye racing throughout the night. Yeah. So... Yeah, maybe that, that had something to do with it, but uh, uh, the the radio chat between him and J JP? GP. GP. I'm so good with names. <laughs> Who did you say your name was again? Uh, was hysterical because GP doesn't put up with any of Max's stuff. Yeah, he just is and, so... And basically at one point said... You know, that's childish, Max. We're not going to argue about other teams on the radio. It's childish. And so, yeah. <laughs> but that's their relationship. Uh, because Max is so strong-willed and, and so driven to win, as, you know, all of them are, but his, he's a little over the top. GP is the perfect personality to have on the radio to rein him in. Matter of fact, you know, they, they basically told him, you know, to ease into this set of tires for this this one run. I can't remember if it was the second stint or the third stint. I think it was after his final pit. Yeah, and and the GP goes, nice job of easing into it there. And then 
Max An goes on to a filled rant. On. Yes, about their strategy, and he wouldn't. Ha we wouldn't ruin the tires if they would have given them a decent strategy, and blah blah blah. And so, uh, you know, just listening to the radio conversations mm -hmm. is highly entertaining a lot of the time. So yeah. So Spa is going to be the last Grand Prix before the summer break, mm -hmm. where they absolutely shut down operations. Nobody's allowed into any of the facilities. Um, so they take about a month off and yeah, they I think come. this time is only about three weeks though. I think it's a required three weeks, right? And then if it's more or less than that, sometimes that happens. So Sunday the 28th is spa and then we come back to Zanvoort on August 25th. Yes. So it's almost a full month. Almost a full month. Yeah. So, so we're going to miss our, our formula one fix during that time. We might get more silly season action, although I feel like silly season kicked off so early this year with the Lewis Hamilton to Ferrari announcement that the yes. whole process has kind of been dragging out from, when was that, like February that he announced yes. that? Yes, yeah. Because that kicked things off way earlier than normally and, would. And Haas made an announcement today. Yes, Esteban Ocon to Haas. I don't love that. I'm not a fan of that either. I feel like he hasn't been a good teammate at any team he's gone to. Yeah. I feel like his chemistry with his teammates has never been good. Certainly hasn't been good with Gasly. It wasn't good with Alonzo either. Yeah. Alonzo hasn't had a lot of great relationships also, but... Uh, you know, he seems to be doing okay with Stroll. Yeah, he understands who the boss is. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's, what, that's just where he needed to go he, originally. He, he's a man that can read an org chart. Yeah. <laughs> and, and when the owner's son is your teammate, Team, yeah. you know. Yes. I well, just, although I, I'm getting the feeling he's about ready to burn that place down too. Yeah, where's he going to go though? He, didn't he just re-sign? Oh, yeah. The, the contracts are no, meaningless if you make yourself a big enough pain in the ass Let's see. you know you can find joint ways out of contracts <laughs> at least to the end of 2026 all right was his new deal man he's gonna be old by the time that rolls around in f1 terms he is old yeah well, yeah he's gonna be even older yes 42 but, right but now. i mean he still demonstrates the skills oh yeah and he, he just is, needs a good car and he is a master strategist from the cockpit yeah it's it's amazing listening to his radio and him knowing what's going on all around the track. Yeah. Because he'll look at like, you know. The TVs. The TVs going on. So he knows what's going on in other parts of the track. Yeah. Like he radioed in at Miami. He was, oh, that was a nice pass, uh, pass by Lance. Yeah. You know. <laughs> really? Yeah. That's what we're paying attention to. We're driving 200 miles an hour and we're... <laughs> Watching TV. <laughs> Must be nice. While making multiple adjustments in the car from turn to turn. Yeah. Yeah. That's why he's one of the goats. Yeah. Still around. Yeah. Anyway, back to Archon. I don't feel for Ollie coming up on a not great team, although potentially getting better here, with a teammate like that. I think that's going to be a rough introduction unless well, it's so clear that Akon is number one on the team that it's not an issue right it might be a couple of years from now that it becomes an issue but well in a couple of years when Hamilton retires Ollie's going to go to Ferrari I mean he is a Ferrari Probably. contract yeah. driver yeah and Haas has a partnership that has been extended with Ferrari so yeah, yeah I'm I, I think Ollie will be okay with being the number two driver for a couple of years until he goes to Ferrari. And then he'll still be probably be the number two driver, but it, maybe it's the situation that Akon needed. I would have rather seen another driver yeah. with Haas personally, because again, as we mentioned, he Esteban is not a good teammate. No. So. And then I think the other news, which we also both kind of raised our eyebrows at, was Mattia Bonotto yeah. 
formerly of Ferrari, going to Audi. The king of the clown memes for Ferrari. Yeah. Yeah. I don't get it. I don't get that one either. <laughs> kind of like the NFL, you know, head coaches just kind of recirculate. And yeah. I think same thing with team principals. They just kind of recirculate. They take a year or two off and then they come back. And Yeah. So I guess we'll have to see. Yeah, you know, maybe he, you know, in the time off, he could reflect on the mistakes that were made. I mean, you have to understand he is a tremendous engineer. Yeah, I was going to say his strength is the technical side. The technical side. It wasn't in strategy, team management, some of those kinds of things. But, you know, when you take time off and you can have that time to reflect on what your weaknesses are, is there a way he can shore those up going into the Audi uh, team? Position. Mm -hmm. And so maybe he hires different people to whether he might have had a weakness to you know, complement and supplement that weakness. Um, we'll have to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but again, he's a great engineer. They're going to be going into new regulations. So having him on board That's probably true. isn't a bad idea mm -hmm. in developing a brand new race car and brand new engine. And so, so I can understand that. I probably would have preferred to hire him as the chief engineer Right. Rather than the team principal, but you know, it's hard to sometimes for those folks to take that step backwards. I think that's what I have on my notes from this week of F1. There's a lot that went on. Yeah, in one two hour race. And the aftermath of that and this week's silly season announcements. And yes. So. Yes. Yeah, everything else I'm I'm in the middle of. So I just started watching this season of Welcome to Rexham because I somehow missed the announcement um, almost three months ago that yeah. it was out. Uh -huh. I think I was so focused on Bridgerton season three coming out at the beginning of May that I like fully missed anything about Welcome to Rexham releasing like a week before that. You're absolutely right. Just totally missed it. And then Googled it and went, Oh, the whole season's out. <laughs> Not only the first couple episodes, it's all out. So all I'm right. in the middle of that and then middle of some podcasts. So lots of in the middle of, in the middle of the fellowship. Yeah. Okay. Well, like people. I said, I've read the first paragraph of this <laughs> yeah. and so. Okay. Okay. That's good. That's a start. I'm going to be focusing on that. I've been watching on Netflix alone. I believe it's what's called it's the survival where they drop 10 people off on these islands in this case in northern Saskatchewan yeah. and see how long they can survive with just a handful of tools and whatnot and I, I I've watched the series before I'm finding this this particular uh, set of characters very interesting and have enjoyed people. watching people <laughs> and they're, well they're, they're characters in their own right there's a couple of them that are real characters. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I've been watching that, but uh, really haven't been watching a whole lot of anything else uh, other than live sports. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, should we transition to uh, some economic news and what's come out in the last week? Yes. So actually, this is a big week with a lot of announcements. And... Um, couple really conflicting notes so looping back around to our cliffhanger from cliffhanger yes the beginning so number one uh the gross domestic product and uh for the second quarter came out and it was a fairly hefty 2.8 percent annualized uh increase in the gdp which was nearly double of the first quarter so the first quarter was like, I think 1.4, 1.5%. I have a graph, I'll throw it up on the screen so that you can see it. So when you look at that and, and some of the drivers, and I have another chart here that will show, a lot of that was driven by consumer spending and services. 
to a lesser degree than it was in the previous quarter, but nonetheless, it was the strongest uh, piece. Mm -hmm. The second strongest piece was change in private inventories, which I think is further demonstration of supply chain issues being resolved and, and whatnot. And then we had non-residential investment and once again, uh, consumer spending, but this time on goods. So okay. it's, it's demonstrating that there's strong demand, by the way, uh, net exports was down. So um, we're still buying, the rest of the world isn't buying as much. So. Interesting. So with that, you would think, well, gee, the economy is chugging right along and the talks of a soft landing seem to be reasonable and whatnot. But this week also, statistics on new home sales came out. And this is one that we talked about last month. Yes. I think on our very first coffee chat episode. Yes. And it was down then. Correct, and it is down once again from last year. And we also talked about how the building industry, the construction industry, often leads um, the country into recessions. And so you, we've seen a couple months of uh, fairly low, just over 600,000 annualized new housing starts. And so I did a little bit more digging and I'll put these charts up so that you can see them and really look at them. Um, calculated risk went back and looked at the level of new home starts and compared it to the start of previous recessions uh, going back to 1963. Starts or sales? Which one are we talking about here? Home sales, I'm sorry, okay. home sales. Home sales, you thank said, you. You said starts a couple times, and I was like, I thought we were talking about sales. We but... are talking about sales. <laughs> so just I be clear on sure. this. Yes. <laughs> okay. And when you take a look at this, you can see that we're at about the same level as where new home sales were for a number of our past recessions. Okay. Going all the way back to the 1970s. Now, does that include the big bubble? burst yes okay so even in the big bubble burst it wasn't until new home sales dropped to at the same point that we are right now that the great recession started interesting yeah so because you can so I'm leaning over here yes you, you can, can see, see a big spike which everything in the real estate industry was spiking then but then you can see the really big drop right and it continued to drop further after that, but yeah. it was at that point that the recession started. Same thing back in uh, the early 90s, back in the 80s. So they've put in this dotted line where you can see where we're currently at and compare it to the starting point of past recessions. Interesting. Okay. Similarly, uh, if you look at months of supply of new homes, not existing homes, which we already know is below past norms. Mm -hmm. Very similar once you get to about this level, maybe a little higher of supply of new homes in months, that recessions start. And what is that? How many months? So about 10 months, okay. between nine and 10 months. So that's so interesting because on the residential side, our months of inventory is way less than that. Yes. So we're seeing months of inventory go up quite a bit on the new sales side. Yes. And it, it's really, um, some, some areas have already felt this extensively, like Austin mm -hmm. and some parts of Florida have seen where their months of supply has really, really increased. I don't know that we necessarily, I'd be curious, I, I should look this up, what, what it is here in Tucson. Um, but Not that. It's, well. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about new builds new, specifically. New, new but builds, but we know. Overall, that, yeah. not anywhere close to that. Yeah, right now our existing homes on the market is pretty close to what they were in 2019 pre-pandemic. So, and that was fairly normal market. So um, it's interesting on that. And then... Um, the other thing that he talks about is initial weekly unemployment claims 
and we're below where most of the recessions have started. So again, it's that conflicting information. We have a healthy GDP. We still are fairly low in our initial jobs claims um, for unemployment. But yet the housing, if you look at it as a leading indicator, is kind of telling us a different story. So, hmm. so we'll take a closer look at this, but it's the first time that I've really looked at the numbers and, and seen how close we are to previous recessions with the housing sales and, and, and whatnot in the months of mm -hmm. inventory. So. so I wonder on, on these new sale numbers going down, we have seen over the last couple of years that the new home builders have been super aggressive about getting buyers in. They've been doing major rate cuts yeah. if you use their in-house lender. And so people have been buying new builds, getting you know, rates in the fours, rates in the fives, um, to make it a little bit more bearable. I wonder if they're sort of running out of their population of people who want a new build. And if those buyers that wanted a new build have gotten into a one in yeah, the last few years. Could be. And now, because as we talk to clients, there are some clients who are like, yeah, I absolutely you know, would consider a new build. Or in fact, I actively want a new build because I want the warranties on it. Right. I don't want to have to deal with the maintenance. You know, that's what I'm looking for. But we have other buyers who won't go anywhere near them. They're like not enough character, you They know. want established neighborhoods, they want established landscaping. Yeah, all sorts yeah. of reasons that they might say that, you know, lots are too close together, all of those sorts of things that we see with more of these new builds. And so I wonder if they are sort of running through their group of potential buyers that would buy yeah. from them and until we get the rest of the market unstuck, because there might be current homeowners who would be willing to buy a new build, but maybe aren't even considering the fact that these new builds have lower rate options because they're stuck in their 3%. And so they're not even thinking about it. They're just seeing the headlines of, you know, interest rates, 7% and right. not even contemplating. Oh, aware. Yes, that they could potentially be yeah. moving. Because uh, while we get inundated from builders with marketing talking about their, the great rates that they're offering clients, please bring us your clients, mm -hmm. you don't see that as much as like advertising on television. No. And so general public awareness, I don't think is there. Might be lower, yeah. Whereas for us, you know, we're, we're abundantly aware of the incentives <laughs> yeah. that the new, new uh, the builders are, are offering on new homes. Yeah. So. I'll be curious if as rates go down, hopefully, you know, at least by the end of the year, if that starts to get some things kind of unstuck from where we've been, and if that helps the builders. Yes. Or is this truly the leading edge of a recession and we're just now starting to see those numbers hit? Yeah. So again, something that we will look at very closely next month mm -hmm. uh, to, to see um, where we are with new home sales because I think once we hit three months we can start to call it a trend, a trend. yeah once is an incidence two is a coincidence well we also a trend. want to look at uh, employment in the housing industry and if you remember the last or earlier this month when we looked at it the housing in uh, sector was still adding jobs but if they start shedding jobs, mm -hmm. then that's going to be a real indicator to Builders me. Builders are nervous. And, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, it, it's always weird when we have these very, very conflicting pieces of information. Yeah. So stay tuned. Yeah. <laughs> we don't have a crystal ball on this one. No. And then you had uh, an interesting item, a chart that came up across our, uh, from CNBC mm -hmm. on real estate email fraud. Yes. So victims losses from email scams in real estate deals. Um, and again, we'll 
make sure this chart goes on the video so you can take a look at it. And this one currently only goes through 2022. And from being in the industry, we know that we keep hearing about this more and more. So I expect when this data comes out and is parsed into this sort of chart for 2023, it will probably be even higher than 2022. Um, but we were just shy of 450 million in losses from email fraud uh, on Scams. real estate. Yeah. yeah on real estate deals. Um, and this is something that when we get new clients and we're first meeting with them and, and kind of talking through the process and whatnot, especially on the buyer side, but we have this conversation with both buyers and sellers, we really harp on wire fraud and the potential scams that you could come across as a buyer. And you know, by the time we get done, we're like, if you are afraid, that was kind of the point. Yes. There's not a lot in this transaction and the process that we try to scare you about, but the wire fraud is one of those. Yeah, and it's it's the only document that we share that has red print on it. Yeah. And and so it really jumps out. And then we just super overemphasize, you will never get wiring instructions from either one of us. Yeah. Absolutely not. And so if you do, let us know. Yeah. <laughs> and if you get any other email from any other source, call a known number. Don't call the number that's on the email. Yes. Call the, a known number that you had a conversation with the folks at the escrow office yes. with before Yes. and verify, did you actually send this to me? And are the numbers correct? And are the numbers correct? Yes, before yes. you send any, any funds. Yes. Um, at and least for us, the initial earnest money deposit we can do as a check, a personal check or a cashier's check or wiring. And so some people skip the wiring initially, but most people, when we get to the end, do wire yes. rather than doing a cashier's check. And so at least at the end, you've had conversations with escrow. You know who you're working with, you know who the team is, and you know what their communication looks like. More and more of these companies are also building their own portals so that you have your own secure login to access your documents through their portal, which also means that they can put their wiring instructions there rather than sending them through email. Right. And so... But even with that... Yes, so that should be there to help you. That being said, we recently heard about a story from um, an agent and a transaction up in the Phoenix area being not that far from us, word of these things travels down sometimes. Yep. And in this instance, I think there are a couple parties to blame here. One, I'd say more than the other. So it starts with the agent got their email hacked. And I think the first and the major part of the blame here is that they didn't share with their clients that their email had been compromised. They were in the middle of at least one transaction and the client got an email from the agent with wiring instructions. So that should Again, have been... We will never <laughs> send wiring instructions as agents. Never. <laughs> at least our business practice. I don't know about anyone else, yeah. but yeah. our business practices, you won't get it from us. So that should have been red flag number one. Obviously the agent didn't know that this was happening, but to the client should have been a red flag. Secondly, the client was already working in one of these portals that I just mentioned, and they were already doing all their documents and had been expecting to get wiring instructions through that portal for their final payment. It didn't come there, it came to their email, and rather than going and verifying that it was legitimate, yep. contacting the agent, contacting escrow, checking their portal, all these things, and so this is why I do feel like there's a small amount of blame to go on to the customer there of, you know, there were things that could have been done to verify this. And this is a seven figure Yeah, we're talking about transaction. A, a million dollars of... Plus. Yeah, of uh, money being transferred. They went ahead and sent that money to those fake wiring instructions. And the good news out of the story was that it was caught early enough that they were able to get the funds back. The but that is rare. 
yeah, you've got about 24 hours typically to know yes. that something has happened and reverse it. Otherwise, the money can be gone. Um, yep. And so the good news here was that the client got the money back. They were made whole. They were able to then wire to the appropriate place and presumably finish their transaction. Yes. Um, but I think that's just another example of how easy it is if you're just not verifying things, not making sure you're doing your due diligence that those wiring instructions are in fact real. And you know, uh, sometimes I think Kelly and I go through all the documents with clients at a almost painful level probably for Snail's them. Snail's pace. <laughs> But we want to make sure that they understand, because you're getting a ton of documents yeah. when you enter into these transactions. And so we walk them through section by section, every document that they're going to sign. And we talk about why that section's in there mm -hmm. and whatnot. And it, it takes a while, mm -hmm. um, but we want to make sure our clients are as fully educated as possible I don't care how many transactions they've gone through before. We had a client uh, last year who, early 80s, mm -hmm. had bought and sold many homes in her time. And she kept on telling us, you've told me stuff that I've never heard from a realtor before. Yeah. I, not in a negative way. I mean, she said, you know, you're providing me with information I have never had from a realtor before. And sometimes part of that is things have changed between. Yes when you may have done your last transaction and and doing one now things are certainly changing starting next month oh yeah yeah so yeah just because you've done a bunch of transactions doesn't mean that the rules are the same yes yes so yeah um uh, email scams yeah be careful out there be careful out there be super aware be wary of everything that you get Yep. So uh, what are you looking forward to uh, this weekend? Well, the Olympics are starting up. Um, I don't know that I'll necessarily watch like opening ceremonies. I don't know. I might if it happens to be on when I turn on the TV at some point. Um, but this weekend, the eventing starts. Three-day eventing oh, starts. Okay. Unfortunately, the timing of it is pretty much the middle of the night for us. So you can record it. Yeah. Do you want to explain a little bit what three-day eventing is for those that might not have a clue? Yeah. So three-day eventing uh, is an equestrian event, a horse event. And as the name suggests, it is done over three days. Mm -hmm. And you have three different disciplines that you do on each of those three days. So the first day is dressage. Um, we sort of like to refer to this as the figure skating of the horse world. Um, if you saw the, the Snoop Dogg um, commentary, the, I don't know if you've seen this. I don't know. I... There was this whole thing of Snoop Dogg watching, I think from the Olympics last time around, watching some of the movements in dressage and his commentary, and it was hilarious. Horses, I like this. This is equestrian. This they is call this, they call this equestrian. By the way, look at that horse. Did you own oh, a horse crip walking car? You see that? <laughs> on the set. That's gangsters of Hey! Oh, oh, come on. Oh, oh, look at this guy. Oh, come on, man. Because, of course, he has no idea what the heck's going on. Of course. Um, we'll see if we can find that link and, and throw that in. Yes. Um, pretty funny one but basically it's the figure skating it's you have a, a set pattern that you're doing and you're being scored on the movements and how well you and the horse execute those movements right um and so it's the sort of frilly yes part now, of three-day eventing i think the important thing to mention here is it for all three days it's the same horse and rider yes so it's the same pairing yep um, and there is also separate, just pure dressage competition. Right. So for the three-day eventers, their dressage is not going to be nearly as good as the people just doing dressage, but they can focus specifically on that. The three-day eventers have two other phases that they also have to 
prepare for. And the second day is probably the most exciting. The second day is cross country, and yes. those are your big natural obstacles that you might find riding out in nature, your logs, your ditches, water jumps, banks, all sorts of things like that. Um, they've certainly gotten more elaborate over the last couple of decades. Um, yes. Sometimes maybe to a point that's a little scary because they've just gotten so big and massive. Um, but the other part of cross country is the distance part. We're talking about miles that they're covering over this course and there's an optimum time. And if you go too slow, you start racking up points. Uh, and if you go too fast, yeah, they're not going to have that issue at this level. Oh, yeah, true. At yeah. the lower levels, yes, there is a too fast speed. Um, right. I don't think anyone's going to run into a too fast at, at this level. Okay. Um, and I think part of where the big jumps has come in is actually over the decades, cross country has gotten shorter. Um, they've taken out some of the additional kind of endurance parts of what used to be involved in, in cross country. And so sort of to compensate, jumps have gotten bigger, bulkier, scarier, all of that. I don't know if that's necessarily the right move. Right. Um, I think it benefits the warm bloods over the thoroughbreds who are the distance right. athletes of the horse world and distance athletes and jumpers of the horse world. And sometimes on some of the courses, if there's a really big hairy jump, there's an alternative that the mm -hmm. riders can take that isn't as big of an obstacle, but takes longer. Or it might be a combination that's right. tricky where you might only have one stride between A and B. And if you take the alternate route, you know, you maybe have three jumps that you do, but they're like in a big circle and you sort of do like a loop-de-doo and then you get on your way. Right. Going to take longer, but better chance of making it through that combination. So it's a trade-off. And yeah. some riders will pre-plan what they're going to do. Some riders will get up to that point, And depending on what their horse is giving them on feedback, they'll make the decision then. Yeah. So that's day two. And I think the other unique thing about cross-country is that there is no separate cross-country only competition. The only way to do cross country is to do it as part of three day eventing. That is correct, yes. So then the third day, you go to the show jumping phase um, or the stadium phase, and there is separate show jumpers also. Again, they're going to be jumping higher jumps than as the pure show jumpers than what the three day eventers are doing. But again, that's their sole focus. That's all they're doing. Right. And coming into the stadium phase of it, these are jumps that fall down. They're the rails that you would see uh, kind of more traditionally. They're in an arena, so it's in an enclosed space. And we're talking about a much smaller distance. You know, typically the time on this is kind of more like 70 seconds, 80 right. seconds, something right. like that as an optimum time. Again, if you go too slow, there's points. Um, on this, if you knock the rails down, that's points added to your score. Right. Um, along with refusals or runouts in the same way that there is for cross country. Um, and so the challenge here is on these big jumps, the horses sort of learn on cross country, how much can they rub over the jumps? Right. Because all they're doing is they just have to get over. It doesn't matter if it's pretty. You come to the stadium part and you start rubbing these poles and they're going to fall. They're going to Well, and, and I've seen, I've watched a number of these competitions and, and sometimes you just see the horses like, I, I'm not even going to bother with these twigs. <laughs> <laughs> and just literally just like kick them out of the way as they go over because it's like, you know, that's not a big log. That's no big deal. Bam. Yeah. <laughs> so. And it's also and day they're also, three. It's, so it's they're the third tired. day. They're tired. They're yep. sore. Yes. I was going to say. Yeah. 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 So but it's, yeah, it's sometimes you just see the horses like, I really don't care. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm done. I am done. I'm uh, th this is nothing like yesterday. Let's yep. just get this over with. Yeah. <laughs> so that's this weekend. Um, it's probably the the greatest, in my mind, demonstration of total equestrian that you're going to get in the Olympics because of the discipline. Yeah, the versatility. The disciplines are so very, very different from one another. And again, you don't get to specialize in mm -hmm. any one thing. Mm -hmm. And um, so that makes it entertaining. I have to set my DVR to record that. Well, and I, I will tell you, I've, I've 
leading up to um, the Olympics, I was like, hey, I'm just not into it. I, I don't really care. And then immediately before the opening ceremonies, you start having preliminary uh, uh, sevens rugby, uh, handball, soccer, and I am watching all of it. <laughs> and it's just like, well, I guess I guess uh, <laughs> I guess I am watching. I, I guess I am watching it. And then, and yeah, of course, you know, the three day eventing is one of my favorite Olympic it's sports. So cool. What what I enjoy is seeing some of the sports that you don't normally get to watch on TV during the Summer Olympics. You know, some of it I, I don't really care for because, you know, you, you have basketball on all the time or whatever. But some of these random niche sports that you never get to watch, like kayaking, yeah. you know, I mean... <laughs> I'm fascinated by watching them go through the, the kayaking course. Yeah. Why? I don't know. But I, I, I just enjoy watching some of these niche, uh, like in the Winter Olympics, you know, curling. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I mean, there's nothing better than watching curling. I, I find it incredibly relaxing. <laughs> you know? Yeah. No, no, no. So, anyway. All right, well. I think that's it for me this time. Okay, well, you know, like I said, the Olympics, uh, looking forward to spa. Mm -hmm. NASCAR is actually taking a couple weeks off because NBC's covering the Olympics and NBC's, this is their part of the schedule for NASCAR that they cover NASCAR. And they just basically asked NASCAR to take a couple weeks off. NASCAR's version of a summer break. Which, you know, if they get one weekend off every three months is big news in NASCAR. So um, taking a two-week uh, vacation, I've already heard little reports what different drivers, apparently a number of them are going on a cruise with their families, like uh, Disney Cruise Line or something oh, like geez. that. Um, so, <laughs> so that's what some of them are doing during their, their break, uh, which, which will be fun to hear, you know, what what happens with the different drivers on this break so so no nascar this weekend and then after next week no f1 until the end of the month so um it's going to be olympics for us i guess yeah all right well then also it might give me time to read my book there so, you go there we go <laughs> all right well with that i guess we're we're finished and uh, we're done we thought this was going to be a short podcast I have a feeling it's not been a short podcast. Yeah, famous last words. Yeah. Okay. Until next week. We'll see you then. Bye. <laughs>